Big Questions with the Dead Milkmen. Welcome to Big Questions with the Dead Milkmen. Today we're going to talk about our memories of making and or first hearing the album Soul Rotation, which is the controversial sixth studio album by the Dead Milkmen. Pardon me, I'm, I have a little cold. Um, people either loved it or hated it. Probably generated more hate mail than any other of our albums, to our P.O. box anyway. <laughs> but, but interestingly, it probably got more critical, positive reviews <sighs> from people who write these things, <laughs> people who write reviews and music music journalists of any of our albums. But the back, a little background is when, <clears throat> while we were on tour for Metaphysical Graffiti, the record company went out of business and we were no longer with the record company. <laughs> uh, but how did we get involved with uh, Hollywood Records, which is a subsidiary of Walt Disney Records? Well, um, the new vice president of Hollywood was Wesley Hine, who was our one of our main contacts at Enigma. He's also one of the owner. He was one of the founders with his brother and someone else. Uh, and he asked us, he encouraged us to uh, sign a deal with Hollywood. He said, it's going to be really cool. They're going to be, <laughs> but we did. Um, and uh, we also knew that Brian Beatty did not want to leave Texas. And we were definitely not going to go to Texas to record this album under any circumstances we wanted to stay in Philly. So we looked around for a producer. I don't remember who who uh, came up with Ted Nicely. I know that Dave was friendly with him. We were all kind of friendly with him from the time that Tommy Keene played in Milwaukee in, uh, in the mid eighties, was that 86 or eight, one of those years. Um, the same place that we, we opened up for. <laughs> more reverb in the monitor. More, more reverb in the monitor, God. <laughs> Johnny Thunders. Um, and yeah, we, we stayed in communication with Ted, at least Dave did, and uh, with a little arm twisting, we got him to agree to produce our album. We went into, the first thing we did was went went with Ted into um, Third Story Recording, which was also the place we re recorded Eat Your Paisley, and we recorded there um, our cover of Southbound Suarez with Ted producing, and five other songs. I thought that this is the, I personally thought that we were recording the Soul Rotation album. I don't know if it had the name yet, but I thought we're working on our sixth album now. But no, Ted decided he couldn't deal with that studio. It was, he wanted something better. And maybe that's a good thing. So after five songs, we went to the warehouse, which is not far from where we practiced at the time. It was near our the same building even. Yeah, so it was really close. <laughs> We knew how to get there easily. <laughs> um, uh, Cinderella I, used to also practice there. Yeah. And we were there when we got to meet Billy Paul. That's right. That's right. Jones right. Yeah. And in, in the process of making, this album was, I think, very egalitarian in terms of music writing. Everybody contributed to music. Dave, Dave contributed more music than he did for Metaphysical. I was on better terms with Dave. Uh, we did their songwriting sessions again, like we used to. I also went to Rodney's apartment and worked on songs um, before getting together. But once we got together, Rodney started bringing these tracks and pamphlets and things that he'll probably tell you more about. And that influenced some of the lyric writing, at least my lyrics. It influenced me to write all, all Around the World, which is a song Dave really liked, Dave Blood. And... Um, a secret of life and uh the way the way ted worked in the studio was not the not at all the way brian looked at it we were recording and we recorded digitally that's another thing dave was excited about recording all digitally so we could have a cd we could be on a cd that was ddd digital mass digital recording digital mixing digital mastering ted recorded us all together but basically he was only looking at the drums to keep the drums and everything else got replaced and it took a long time in the middle of it all dave had to have surgery dave blood had to have surgery on his back i think it was and it wasn't planned but he had to have it it was like 
one of these thing, imminent things he had to do. So, and he was out a, around a few days and like not quite a week, but in, in the time that the uptown, up, uptown horns were scheduled to record on a couple of the songs. And one of them was how, how it's going to be. Dave hadn't done his bass part yet. It was just a scratch. Ted recorded the bass part himself for the uptown horns. And this, I do remember Dave coming back and being very, very upset with Ted over that. But Dave got to record. It wasn't like he was planning on keeping his the Ted track, but Dave played the Ted track. Dave, Dave played his own bass on that. So there's no guest appearance on Soul Rotation by Ted. Um, I know that we rented the, the, the digital tape machine. It wasn't part of the warehouse. And that was a lot of the expense of making the album. We also had a caterer for lunches. Somebody came and catered our lunches for us. I think it was all vegetarian too. I don't remember date with Dave's a very picky eater, as I've already mentioned, but everything was <laughs> approved of ahead of time. No mushrooms. No mushrooms. <laughs> a slap in the face to Joe. <laughs> I love mushrooms. But that's Joe okay. loves mushrooms. And that's, that's why we much. keep Joe in the dark and just feed him a bunch of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and like on later albums, I didn't, a lot of the songs I sang, I didn't write the lyrics for. <laughs> like, <laughs> Here Comes Mr. X. And Dean wrote the lyrics for At, Dean wrote At, uh, At the Moment and Big Scary Place. Just so you know. And now let's hear what yeah. Dan has to say about hearing it. <laughs> It's Dan, son of Danther, the chief. Um, I had a copy of this album on a tape and the other side was Metaphysical Graffiti. So I kind of like knew those two albums together. Um, but I always remember feeling like the Soul Rotation kind of stood out from every other album. Um, I mean, for one thing, like I, I thought at first that Rodney had left the band, maybe <laughs> until like the conspiracy song. You <laughs> know, it almost it's almost like the opposite of of Big Lizard, where like Joe sings a couple songs on that, and Rodney sings most of them, and then on this, Joe sings most of them, Rodney sings a couple. Um, I only sang one song on Big Lizard. <clears throat> what? I only sang one song on Big Lizard and Eat Your Paisley. Oh, true. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I do remember um, when I ended up getting this on CD, it was in, like, a long box. Remember those, like, long rectangular boxes they were in? I guess that was to try to ease us out of, like, vinyl rec like, the size of So records. they could save on the shelves that they already had installed in the record shop, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, they didn't press vinyl of this one. No. Um, <clears throat> I, do, I do remember uh, thinking that it was... Not that it was like a softer album, but that it was more produced and that something like Belafonte's Inferno has like a very like mellow like feel to it, but the lyrics are kind of like not disturbing, but they're, you know, they're kind of weird. Um so I there's definitely like I always definitely consider this like a great Dead Milkman album, but um it's never been like my favorite. So you're one of the people who sent the hate mail. <laughs> no, but I do have my friend Melissa when we were younger uh, said when she heard this album she cried. <laughs> <laughs> not not tears of joy, but tears should, of pain. Should have been more me on it. <laughs> <laughs> but then she said when by the time not Richard but Dick came out, you guys were redeemed. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, yeah, okay. there's some yeah, there's some good like it's. It definitely, um, it's like a major label. It's funny that you guys signed on to a major label at a time when like like rock bands were starting to get on the radio and then you put out like an album that was like less, <laughs> less when rock. We'll get to that. <laughs> get to, when I get to the timeline, yeah. So that's it for me. We in the fall of 91. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think it's it's a kind of a sleeper album. I mean, I always liked the album. It got a lot of flack for a while, but 
I always thought it was a pretty good record. Um, yes, it's more produced, and Joe mentioned it got good reviews from the critics. I don't know. They said things like that. We could finally write songs and play our play our instruments or something like that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, I was going to talk more about the digital aspect of it. Um, yes, we did rent a Mitsubishi 32-track um, digital recording or recorder, which was kind of cutting edge at the time. And I think they had to bring it down from New York. And the thing about the warehouse studio was it was upstairs. And so they had to get like four guys carrying this humongous recording machines. Well, I have some pictures which will flash up here, up this flight of stairs, and it was not pleasant. Um, they finally got up there, and then they got it all hooked up, and then we had to learn how to use it. Um, and in fact, I have the master tapes from that album, and here's tape number one, and you can see the songs on it right here, Belafonte's Inferno's the first song. Um here comes Mr. X is on there. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is a one inch digital tape um, that went on that machine. Um, and that's a giant, has a giant floppy disk on the inside cover. Mm -hmm. And then also I discovered, I just opened it up today. I haven't opened it up. It'll, uh, I haven't seen this in a while. I just got, the uh, master tapes from a lot of our records it has like song notes um it has three floppy disks uh yeah. one is labeled uh shaft in greenland <laughs> uh one just says dead milkman on it one says system folder studio 3da and then it has some track sheets um I'll I'll take some pictures of these and send them, and we can get them into the into the. There's even uh, even the chord outline for Shaft and Greenland, which is probably what Ted nicely used to record his bass part, probably. <laughs> so anyway, and then there's some like counter numbers, like where the songs start and end. Anyway, so that came out of that box. But anyway, yes, as Joe mentioned, it was a di all digital recording. It was DDD on the CD when it finally came in, digitally recorded, digitally mastered, and then released on CD, which is a digital format. Um, so, yeah, that's the thing I remember. I would also like to add that um, it's probably it might be my favorite album cover of yours. I, I considered getting it as a tattoo when I was younger, but I never did and probably won't. But um yeah, I just always liked that cover. And actually the whole yeah, the whole insert is good. The picture of you guys like floating in space. That I tattoo would have would have would have, would have earned you uh, much respect in the big house. <laughs> so yeah, I'm done. Okay, I got a ton of notes here. This one might run a little bit long. Um, by the way, Dan, about the cover and the poster that came with it, um, if you watch season one of, um, what do we call that, of uh, Castle Rock, um, which was based on the Stephen King thing, one of the ways they let you know, there's a little Easter egg in there. There's a Dead Milkman Soul Rotation poster on the wall, and the show takes place in 1991. That was a little way of a little nod of saying something might not be what you think. So I thought that was clever, and I was glad to be part of that. Um, so um, let's start here. Uh, first of all, notes. You talked about southbound either Suarez or Suarez. I can never remember. Suarez, um, I think. I don't know. That is the longest I ever went without sleep working on that. Um, Matt Dubin, my buddy, and I went without sleep for maybe four days working on that album. And then um, that's the, the famous one where I went home and I have my, my studio set up like next to my bed, all my keyboards and everything. And I, I popped down in the bed and I was like, am I asleep or awake? I'm not quite sure. And I thought, well, if, cause I've been up playing music, like working on stuff. And I thought, well, if I look in the bed and I'm in the bed, clearly I'm dreaming this. So I, I looked in the bed and I wasn't in the bed and then so I dropped down into the bed. And as soon as I hit the bed, I sat up and I realized I'd actually been sleepwalking. So that that's my memory of that. Um, also, Ted Nicely, big Mystery Science Theater 3000 fan. Um, this was pre-internet, uh, sort of. We had bulletin boards and things like that. Um, but we uh, um, we had tapes 
uh, VHS tapes of Mystery Science Theater. And we showed him to Ted, and Ted would lie on the sofa watching him in the studio and just laugh his ass off and make us show the stuff over and over again because he would laugh through it. So that was that was kind of a nice bonding experience. Well, you're like, Ted, uh, you got to record us at some point, buddy. <laughs> uh, there's no need. When you're in the studio, you can get around to recording, but you need to set the atmosphere. The atmosphere has to be right. And uh, you have- well, speaking of Ted, the engineer on the album was Eli Janney. Yes. Who- is uh, currently, I think, the band leader on Late Night with Seth Myers, yeah. and also he's a member of the uh, great band Girls Against Boys. Great band, Girls Against Boys. Yeah. Um. So the uh, um going back. Okay. So my notes. So um, I would say this is the sort of album that people who write for the AV Club, you know, the Onion AV Club. This is the sort of album they would like. It's like it's not nearly as aggressive or angry as their previous material. You know. Mumsy can listen to it at the at the yachting club. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, a friend of mine also said the same thing about. It's it like I was thinking that. Um, so I'm going to give you a little timeline here, folks, to kind of explain the album. So in 1988, a book comes out called High Weirdness by Mail, and I actually have a signed copy signed by Reverend Stang of the Church of the Subgenius. Some of you are probably freaking out a little bit right now. Uh, over here, by the way, if we go to which page is it? Uh, if we go to, uh, it looks like page 58. Oh, page 50. Um, you can see uh, the Unarius Church. And this is sort of how they came into our orbit. Uh, I had written them. And I wrote pretty much everybody in this book. Again, this is on the cusp of well, at, when I first had it, it was pre-internet. So I used to get a lot of mail from crazy people. And this would cost me a lot of relationships. Uh, one of the people writing actually put a curse on me that my buddy Matt Dubin was standing next to me when I opened it. And there's no way you get out of a curse unless you sleep with a witch. So do that. Um, but the, uh, um, so that was kind of, now I just want to point out some, oh, by the way, one of the pieces of, of mail that came, because Dean was sitting in the studio with me when I was opening my mail and going through, because he didn't mind getting a curse. And, uh, and and by the way, one guy, my favorite guy, is the guy who every couple of weeks would send out an email, a letter, not email, a letter uh, predicting the end of the world. And then a few weeks later, he'd have to send out a correction letter saying, I forgot to carry the two. So <laughs> this is what I was just getting stacks and stacks of this stuff coming to my house. Uh, and again, uh, you know, a lot of young ladies were not fans of it. So um, so Dean and I are sitting there and this, I've got this, a booklet basically someone sent me. And on the cover of it, it said, Beyond Reincarnation, Soul Rotation. And Dean started laughing his ass off and said, that would be a great, great title for an album. So that's how the, the, the album uh, got the title. And then I said, we'll call it that, but you have to let me call an album, Punk's Not Dead, But Limbaugh Is. He said, yes, <laughs> one day I will. <laughs> um, so um, where am I here? Um, now, now, here's a problem. Um, yeah, the album is all about conspiracy theorists. At one point, we thought that was funny. We did not realize that people like us engaging and having a good laugh at these folks, like a good humored laugh, was going to lead to our current erosion of freedoms. We did not realize the crazies who were around the corner. Um, if we had, maybe there would have been a song at the end of the album praising critical thinking. I don't know. But it's something that a lot of people have been pointing to lately saying, hey, we all thought this stuff was funny. We even had a guy once in our, our comment section as a cesspool people. Uh, but the guy was like, we were talking about the QAnon people. Or they like to be called pig fuckers. Uh, sometimes they like to be called puppy rapists. But um, they, uh, um, he was saying, they're funny. They're, they're just like, you know, the um, flying spaghetti monster people. And I think he said this before January 6th. So there was a time pre-Heaven's Gate, uh, before they convinced all the people about Operation Jade Helm, all that, when this stuff was kind of fun. Um, it's kind of lost a lot of the fun. Um, so um, I always say if the guy, I don't know if folks remember Time Cube. If the Time Cube guy was still alive, he would be a staple of right-wing podcasts. You know, and again, another another great commenter. The guy said, I don't care how long, insert right wing podcaster's name here, is proven wrong. I will still continue to listen to him because I am not a sheep. <laughs> that should be a song. Um, so, um, OK, so this was in 1988. I get this lovely book. And for a while, I am corresponding with the weirdest of the weird, including, like I say, the, uh, getting stuff from the Inaris people. They're going to come up in, again in a little bit. So. Uh, in 1991, Nirvana releases an album called uh, I, 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 Rumors. I don't know. I, I didn't listen to it. Um, but 
at this point, yeah. 1991, yeah, we're getting we're getting ready to make the new one. People asked me too in interviews back then, like, aren't you really excited about this Nirvana and 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 all this grunge? I'm like, no, I, I don't like it. I actually preferred Octung Baby to to um uh to Nevermind. I think the Octung Baby was the last album that all the dead milkmen bought before we fractured. Um, but the uh, um the thing was that um they were like, you know, like this this is getting really big and this is and if you tell me to do something, I'll go in the opposite direction. So these like record people were like, you know, oh, um, you know, well, we want you to make something. We we're kind of hoping we were going to make something in the Nirvana vein. And we thought, no, we're going to we're going to make something like yes would make or something like so we we flipped around there and decided to go a different route. Um now in uh 1993, so this album comes out in 1992, and it's a little bit ahead of the game. In 1993, a show called The X-Files comes on, and it's basically the TV version of this album. Uh, and if we had been a little bit later, there's an album called Songs in the Key of X. A lot of people were on. If we'd been a little bit later with this and we hit it just right, um, but this was a little ahead of the game, and so people weren't aware of that. Um, now, behind me, I'm just reading off my notes here. These were random thoughts. This is the sampler used on the album, the actual sampler. I have it loaded up with some stuff. Probably can't see this. This is the Ebo guitar uh, that was used on wonderfully colored plastic war toys. A title I stole from Joe. Joe had the title. Didn't seem to be really doing much with it. So I'm like, I'm going to take that title and write a song around it. Um, and the, the crazy people used to live upstairs from me and they were horrible people. Um, they used to hear me practicing that and they hated that song. So that had to be on the album. Um, I've got the, the Schwamm from Belafonte's Inferno which is like a medieval instrument. Uh, over here, I put in the flute from uh, Silly Dreams. And then the last thing I just have popped in here is the distorted guitar that I use for the sort of secondary guitar on um, on uh, Big Scary Place. So these are the actual sounds from some of the actual discs that were used on, on the album. Not often you get to see that when you, when you do something like this. Um, now, um, one thing I will say, we did have the uh, Uptown Horns in, which was an honor to have them in. Looking back on it, I would have just used the original horns that I did um, uh, because the original horns were Miami Sound Machine. They were they were a disc I got, and it was totally legal, of Miami Sound Machine samples put out by the Insonics people. Uh, and I thought it would have been really subversive to use that. I think, you know, our first album, which people love, was just the four of us. I would have probably put either put some weird effect on it or something, but just made it a little bit harsher. Uh, Uptown Horns did a great job. Again, honored to work with them, but I think it's more, you know, it, it, it's more of a thing where, you know, older bands have brought in these sort of, you know, horn players and stuff like that. And we should have just taken a different track and said, no, we got a sampler. Um, at one point, I tried to scam money out of the record company um, to spend on booze by telling them we'd hired a flute player to play on Silly Dreams. They couldn't tell. Um, <laughs> but then somehow footage emerged, again, pre-internet, but somehow they got footage of me feeding discs into this thing. Um, so that's uh, um, what happened. That Also, if you're, it was supposed to kind of be a concept album, but I think that I, I don't know. I love it. The concept kind of floated in now. It's like if you have a concept out from, about nuclear war, make sure somebody doesn't write a song about kitty cats. But generally, it does fit together pretty pretty well. So it does have have kind of a cohesive feel, which is, you know, for us, is kind of rare. Um, talk about the video for a minute here. There's a video for it for the uh, um, for the song Secret of Life. And the video is based on a uh, a one of the things I got through setting off to get weird stuff is a little movie called The Arrival. Uh, we've mentioned it before. That's the one with, how can you help me? I'm Zan, uh, you know, a son of Zanford, the chief. And, you know, Zan, you've mid lived many lives. Well, no, I'm Zan, and I've always been Zan. So it's just a really weird uh, film. Um, Adam Bernstein, now here's where the coincidence gets heavy. Adam Bernstein's guy who directed most of our videos, his roommate at Princeton was David Duchovny of the X-Files. So, yeah, it gets a little weird. Um, but um, 
he went and actually visited the Unarius people. And one of the Unarius people told him, he um, goes, well, I, I don't like war. And Adam's like, I don't like war either. Let's hang out. And he's like, I don't like war because I served under Napoleon. Napoleon was mean to me. So I hope that turns out up in the new Napoleon film. Um, and here's a fun fact for you fellas. Drab Majesty, who have appeared on this show in picture form, uh, four, four time uh, big question winner, Drab Majesty, um, Actually, our, uh, on the next tour, we'll be showing the arrival behind them and playing a live soundtrack to it. So, hooray, hooray for you, Trap Majesty. You, you, you live up to the dream. So, is, I know, the, is the arrival available on YouTube? I haven't even. Yeah, you can watch it for free. I'll put up a link. Um, I think I may have mentioned before and thrown up a link there, but yeah, if you see it, you will throw up. My sister has a degree in psychology, my younger sister, and I showed her the arrival once and it gave her a migraine. So it is, uh, um, yeah, it is quite the album. And uh, um, like I say, still have these these massive pieces of hardware that were part of it. Real quick though, did you guys, um, did you guys do demos for this album? Like, yeah, Ted? Ted came into the rehearsal studio with us. Ted nicely didn't live that far away. Yeah. DC. And by this point, I had, you know, sequencers and stuff. So it's mm -hmm. like, you know, I could put everything together and ship it out, you know, so. You can count them. We did five. a couple of rehearsals with him and yeah. played through the songs and he yeah. maybe tweaked a few things, but we pretty much got to say how they went. I would like to recommend a video. Actually, my, my boyfriend sent me some training videos, someone did a mix of training videos that from 1990, they're unintentionally funny, I guess. Maybe intentionally in a way, I don't know. But the one that I really liked was from Blockbuster, 1990. I, I don't know if, Dan, you had to watch any of these videos when you worked there. It's probably before your time. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll put a link to it. But it's this guy named Buster trains the young lady but through the monitors in the store only she can see them and it's it's there's two parts to it so i'll put a link to that and also i just found out somebody did a 8-bit version of the big questions theme song and that's on youtube too um someone named dizzy or the channel's called dizzy janitor and it's pretty cool but i'll put a link to that joe are you familiar with everything is terrible no. They, they get a hold of a lot of those training films and show them on their they do sometimes live stuff but they also have oh. like youtube channels and stuff yeah okay and, and, yeah i love those films i've seen that blockbuster film i love if you have training films show them to me my favorite is the spongebob people order our patties training them <laughs> poop anyway <laughs> um i would like to recommend um eat spinach it's you can eat just raw spinach, or you could have uh, chopped, cooked spinach. Um, that's not your thing, but you still want to eat spinach. Maybe put a little bit of vinegar on it. Um, but yeah, go ahead and eat spinach. I can eat raw spinach, but not cooked spinach. Really, what I eat baby like spinach because it? it's made from real babies. I don't like, you don't like the spinach. texture of it. I don't like the texture or the smell. Like eating seaweed. Yeah, it's terrible. I don't, I don't <laughs> mind seaweed. I like sushi quite a bit, but yeah. Um, I would like to recommend a video and then uh, the related album. The video is um, called "The Lamentations of Jeremiah." It's by Vince Clark. Uh, it's a great video, great song, and it's from Vince Clark's. I believe it's his. A first solo album. Yes, it's called Songs of Silence, and you can check it out on Bandcamp, and you can order it, and you can. It's on all the streaming services, so check it out. It's it's very good, very moving, and uh, I I like it. Vince is like me, still haven't got around to a solo album. <laughs> um, so I'm going to recommend something new, something old, and then something live. New, the new Camlan album, uh, Dismantle. Is, is fantastic. Actually, Alex Reed over at um, I Die, You Die uh, went nuts for it. So we'll, we'll throw in a link to that. He he loved it. I think it's very, very good. He basically says it's one of the best albums ever made. Um, I'm a big Camland fan. Uh, and then I recently found out they started the project when they were in middle school. And one of them isn't even 20 yet. Where do you put your hate? Where do you put your hate? Um, so the uh, um, they're from Indonesia, really good band, and that's the band I mentioned last week uh, when I kind of said that if you're if you're listening to a place to bury strangers or to uh, Emily Rob, 
you don't get to stand up on a up on a um you know a high hill and go oh shame on you for doing this no but if you listen to this album it'll give you the right to criticize things that's where I get my right to criticize things up next an old song that I just chanced upon the other day um and remembered it and it made, brought back a flood of memories it was Proustian um it was uh, um a song by Paul Kelly called Dumb Things. You know, I remember I pawned my hat, I sold my, I'd done all those dumb things. It reminded me of when we used to be on tour and you hit a K-Rock station. And this is a song from 1987, back when all the record companies thought everybody should sound like uh, Midnight Oil or The Alarm. And every video took place in the Australian outback and looked like it was Mad Max. Uh, and then the last thing, if you live in Philadelphia... This Saturday, which should be the day that this airs, um, go out that night to the fire. Now, the fire is not a live nation venue. It is okay to go there. Go out to the fire and see the Tone Bandits, Howlin', Give Us Moon, and uh, um, Candy Cigarettes. So go see all those bands. That is at 412 West Gerard Avenue, and it's 21 plus to get in. But uh, you go, and I guarantee you will like all four of those bands. I have one more thing. Christmas came early. Henry Kissinger died. Oh, really? Oh, oh. I always think of the thing of, of death, you no know, death with the claw machine. And he's like, Rosalind Carter, why can't it be Kissinger? <laughs> oh, oh, what a horrible human being. My God, my God. The, the, the only difference between Charles Manson and Henry Kissinger is Charles Manson had an alibi for the My Lay Massacre. <laughs> <laughs> Or Henry Kissinger had an alibi. Sorry. Anyway, I thought I'd share that with you. I just, right. I just yeah. found that out about half an hour ago. Whoa! Whoa! I got some party in the do. I'll, I tell him I'm coming in late tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Not every death diminishes us, folks. <laughs> Doesn't. <it? laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Oh shit! I forgot. Uh, R.I.P. Sad. R.I.P. Jordy Walker. Uh, yeah. So, bye.